Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 154, and we're going to talk about the pros and cons of having a build with no type of burning gas, that is propane, butane, LPG, whatever. We're also going to talk about why having a rug, but not a carpet, might be a good idea. A tale from the road involving a supernatural key, and a product review of a rather strange dehumidifier. Doesn't that sound exciting? Hey, welcome back, everyone. Thanks for being here. It has been a busy time for me. I just completed an interview with FNA Van Life. Get it, FNA? Yep, with Frankie and Alex. They're big on YouTube, and they have their own podcast, and they're on Instagram, and of course, they're everywhere. I've been following these guys for years, and they've had a lot of adventures on the road. They're currently in Costa Rica, having driven there from, boy, I don't know where they started, somewhere up in the Pacific Northwest, I think. But they're having a time, and along with their dog Paco, they share their travels. And what I really like about these guys is they're completely honest. They're they're a quote-unquote warts and all kind of a podcast, and you can learn a lot from everything that goes wrong as well as everything that's right. And as I've said many times, if you just look at Instagram to check out your van life experience, you're going to get the wrong impression. But you'll also get the right impression because some moments are just that cool. And the FNA Van Life guys get to experience that as well. So probably on Saturday, I will drop a bonus episode of an interview with Alex, Frankie, and Paco, double chihuahua wonder dog, cutest dog on YouTube. Also, several folks have written to me asking me to do an episode about traveling with pets. And I've talked about this before. One of my first episodes was about traveling with pets. And I have a lot of opinions on this. It's something I've thought about a lot. And I personally don't travel with pets because the way I travel requires more flexibility than a pet would give me, basically. And the pets that I have are two cats that are very, very comfortable laying around the condo. I don't think they would be good for van life. But Alex and Frankie have, like, the perfect van life dog, and we talked a lot about what it was like traveling with Paco. So if you're interested in traveling with a pet for van life, absolutely you're going to want to check out this bonus episode, because we talk about Paco an awful lot, and uh, and you'll see why. It's, it's worth checking out. But in the meantime, I got a note from Nigel from New Zealand, one of my all-time favorite countries. If I could move to any country in the world without any worries about hassles or economies or money or anything like that, I would probably pick New Zealand because I like it that much. It's, it, I felt instantly comfortable there. It's beautiful. It's just, I can't say enough good things about New Zealand, and I've been fortunate enough to go there twice. So, Nigel, I appreciate your listening, and I absolutely appreciate you writing. But what Nigel writes is interesting, and we're going to have a talk about it. He says this, I don't use LPG for a few reasons. Space, cutting a hole in my van, regulations and certification, something else to run out of, temperature issues, and complexity. He uses a diesel heater. So, long story short, the way he handled this was instead of using propane or LPG or butane, we'll talk about the differences in a second, he uses electricity for lighting and things like that. He uses a diesel heater for heat because his vehicle runs on diesel anyway, so he already has diesel. And for cooking, he decided to go with an alcohol stove. Now, in the U.S., alcohol stoves are not very common unless you're doing some backpacking, in which there's a thing called a penny stove that some people use. You can make an alcohol stove out of a soda can. But other than that, they're seen mostly in the sailing community, boating community. They're very popular on sailboats, and some people have taken the sailboat alcohol cooktops and brought them into a van. So... That's what he did, that's what Nigel did, and he wrote to me saying, you know, hey, consider this, and maybe it would be a good episode, and I agree. So, let's back up a bit. Why do people use a flammable, explosive, and poisonous gas in their vans to begin with? And the answer is simply, there's a whole lot of energy in LPG, and yes, LPG tanks take up a lot of space, but there's a lot of energy stored in there, and that energy can be very easily turned into heat, 
for a l relatively little amount of money. If you want to try to produce that same amount of heat with electricity, it's going to be very, very difficult. And you can produce similar amounts of heat with diesel. In fact, I think diesel carries more energy per mole or gram or however you want to measure than propane. But the problem is that basically it's a liquid and it has a strong odor. We just don't use it. I mean, that, that's actually the biggest problem here. We absolutely could have diesel cooktops in all of our vans. It's just that they're not available very commonly. They, they do exist. So that's why people use LPG. It's easy. It's, it's convenient. And it depends also on what country you're in. Now, in the U.S. currently, we have these exchange tanks that are available almost everywhere. Every Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards has one. A lot of gas stations have them. Some supermarkets have them. And you just take your 20-pound tank when it's empty and put it in a machine or give it to somebody, and they give you a new quote-unquote full tank, and you're done. It's super easy. In other countries, that's not true. They have to go to a gas station or a, a petrol station or something like that and have somebody fill them up. Also in other countries, the gas they use might not be LPG. It might be butane, which you can get in much bigger tanks in other countries. So everything I say is pretty much US-based because that's where I have the most experience, but I absolutely know the difficulties of using gas in Europe, especially because every country has its own standard for attachments. And I've talked to some folks who travel around Europe and they have this big bag of brass attachments so they can get gas wherever they go. So sticking back to the US, LPG stands for liquefied petroleum gas. It's commonly called propane. It's actually a mixture of gases. There's butane and methane and probably ethane and some other gases in there. It doesn't matter. It's basically natural gas that's been compressed into a liquid state so that it's easy to store and move. It's very good for cooking and heating. It's very easy to light. It's very easy to manage. And a lot of people will disagree with this, but it's actually very safe. Now, sure, we hear these horror stories about propane tanks exploding and things like that, or carbon monoxide coming off of propane and suffocating people. Uh, yeah, that happens. That absolutely happens. But we also hear about electrical fires. We also hear not so much because it's not so common, but alcohol has problems too. You may have heard of the Mary Celeste, the uh, sailboat that was found floating off the Azores with nobody on board. Well, one of the leading theories about why that was is because they had an alcohol leak and the hull filled up with alcohol vapor, which is explosive. Now, that hasn't been proven, but that very well may be what has happened there, and it's probably the best explanation there is. So everything has dangers. It's all about how you handle it. With electrical, you want to set your electrical up properly and use the heavy enough cables and have fuses. With alcohol, you need to be very, very sure that you keep it in temperature-controlled environments and in tight containers. And with propane, well... The proper way to have propane in your vehicle is to have your propane tank installed in a locker, which is just a sailing term for a cabinet. It doesn't necessarily need to be locked. In fact, it probably shouldn't be locked. And that locker should have a one-inch drain in it that allows gases to escape out the drain because propane is heavier than air. And it should be sealed so the gas can't get out anywhere else. If you do that and you install your propane lines properly, you're very safe. It's really very safe. Of course, you should also have a carbon monoxide detector. I mean, that, that just goes without saying. You should have that regardless of what you're using in there. But okay, that all that said, let's say that for whatever reason you have decided not to use propane. And, and like Nigel says, there are reasons. If, if those big propane tanks take up space. Those little green cans take up space because you go through them so much properly installed you do need to cut a hole in your van and and in other countries not so much in the u.s you do need to have any gas connection certified so in some countries if you install say a gas stove in your van you need to go have that certified before you can drive the vehicle legally in the u.s there's probably laws and certifications but nobody's aware of them nobody pays any attention to them i had my vehicle officially inspected by the state of illinois and they didn't ask one single question about my fairly complex propane setup. So that varies a lot. As for complexity, I don't find propane all that complex because I have used it for a very long time. And I actually was a certified propane dispenser or something like that. I actually had a certificate, um, a license, if you will, for filling propane tanks when I worked at an RV dealership in Utah. 
But all right, you have decided you're not going to use propane. So what are your options? Electric, yes. You can use electricity to cook. You're going to need a lot of batteries and something very robust to charge those batteries with. And most people these days are using what is called an induction cooktop, which is a flat glass plate. And there's a magnetic reaction that heats up pans made out of an iron material, like cast iron works great. Most pans will work, but not solid aluminum pans and not glass pans or anything like that. That's a great option. It's, it's very, very safe. There's no flame. There's no off-gassing other than from what you're cooking. The problem is it uses up a ton of power, and that's a problem. You can use alcohol burners. Now, first, the first rig I had when I was in Chicago was a little tiny pop-up camper, and I used an alcohol stove in there. It was this thing I got on Amazon. It was like 10 bucks, and for alcohol, I would use heat. H-E-E-T in these yellow containers from the auto parts store, it's just methanol. And I would pour in an amount of methanol and then light it on fire and that would totally cook whatever I was cooking. I could easily boil water. The problem is that it wasn't controllable. There was no knob. The flame was what it was. And I couldn't even turn it off other than snuffing out the flame. And then I had this thing half filled with alcohol that could like spill all over the place. So if you are going to get an alcohol stove, definitely go to Marine Outlets. Look at what they have. They're usually a countertop kind of unit that has pads and you fill the pads with alcohol and then you light them. And some of them have dampers that will let you adjust the flame. And they're very, very safe. I, I think propane is a little better if you're in the U.S. Alcohol has the danger of it spilling. And it also has a problem where that alcohol in those stoves will evaporate over time and you know you seal them but it doesn't matter it's still going to evaporate over time so if you leave your van with one of these stoves in it for a month you might come back and find out that all that alcohol has gone so one thing that nigel said is that he called propane something else to run out of and to me that's a benefit not that it's something you're going to run out of but it's that you have more than one way to do things so currently in my van I can cook with electric. I have a robust enough battery at 200 amp hours that I can cook with an induction cooktop or use an electric kettle. I have to be very careful about how I do this. If I do it too much, I'm going to kill the battery. But I can do that, so I have electric cooking. I also have a built-in propane cooktop that's, that's very nice. It's just like a kitchen in a house. And I have a portable cooktop that uses butane. This gives me the ability to cook inside, outside, in various conditions. And if one of them runs out, I've got a backup. So I like having multiple fuels. And my heater is a diesel heater too, so I'm not going to cook with that, but I'm just saying I use electricity, diesel, butane, and propane because it gives me maximum flexibility. But you do you. You don't have to have propane, but there's a reason so many people do, especially in the U.S., and it boils down to expense and convenience. Tech Talk. So you will see most people, when they're talking about build-outs, saying, oh no, don't install a carpet, which is a little ironic, because if you look at most RVs built before, say, 2010, they all had carpet. If you get any old RV, you're going to find carpet everywhere, probably in more places than you want. I mean, you might find carpeted bathrooms, half-carpeted walls. It was the 70s when they started building things like this, and they just carpeted everything. And, well, one of the reasons is that it's cheap. But carpet is a problem because it gets wet, it gets grimy, you have to vacuum it rather than sweep it, and it's not a great solution for floors in a van. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about four-way stretch carpet that you put on the walls. That's not really a carpet. It's more of a fabric. It's a different thing. So forget about that. We're just talking about like wall-to-wall -wall carpet for your van. You don't want to do that. And I don't think I'm surprising anybody by saying that. What you want to put on your floor is some easily cleanable waterproof surface, whether it be artificial flooring or a treated piece of marine plywood or a sheet of vinyl or whatever. There's, there's 800 million solutions. That's what you want to have your floor be, because then you can sweep it out and mop it out and you don't have to worry about it. But, <laughs> you knew there was a but coming, right? In both my ambulance and my NV200, I have had rugs. And I have come to really, really like having rugs. Now, let's be clear about the difference between a rug and a carpet. Carpets are wall-to-wall -wall and don't come out. 
rugs are portable and they come out. And there are many, many rugs that you can get that are perfect for your vans. The way my ambulance is set up, I have a bed seat, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bench seat that converts into a bed running down one side, cabinets on the other side. So I basically have this big long hallway and there are carpets that just fit perfectly in that space. I got mine at Ikea, but they're runner carpets and I get all the benefits of a carpet, which are it's nicer to stand on. It's a little bit warmer. If my shoes are a little wet, the carpet absorbs it. And I get all the benefits of the regular durable floor. And my ambulance is this big, thick vinyl. I can take that rug out. I can take it to the car wash, you know, the coin up car wash and spray it down. And as long as it's a nice sunny day, I can leave it out, let it dry. And even if it's not those conditions, I can roll it up and sweep out the van and then just shake it out. And that gets rid of most of the dust. It's just the best of both worlds. You get the best things from carpet and the best things from just the bare floor. And it doesn't cost very much. It's like 30 bucks. So one secret, if you're thinking about doing this, is that stores like Home Depot sell this stuff by the foot. It's not that varied in color. If you want a fancy one, you're going to have to do a lot more research. But if they're very inexpensive at Home Depot, in Lowe's and Menards and places like that, and if, when you get them by the foot, you can just get exactly the size you want. And especially if you have pets, uh, I don't know. I, I would not want to have a rig right now without at least one rug. But, and actually, I have two. I think it's a great idea to have a, a, a doormat right by the sliding door because you don't have a mudroom in these things. When you come in from the outside, you're going to have a space that you're going to need to put muddy, wet boots on, and that's what I use that for. So, very simple little tip, but it actually makes a big impact on my van life experience. Tales from the road. So I grew up in Salem, Massachusetts, and I grew up in a section of Salem, Massachusetts called Witchcraft Heights. Yeah, I know that sounds a little weird. I went to Witchcraft Heights Elementary School, and no, I didn't learn any witchcraft. It was just kind of the normal thing if you're from there. Our logo was a witch flying, our school colors were orange and black, and it wasn't Halloween all the time like it is in Salem now, but there was definitely some knowledge that something had happened here in the past. At any rate, I lived on a hill with big, steep driveways, and we would, you know, race cars up and down the driveways and stuff. And then one day, I was out there with my friends. I was maybe 12 or 13, and um, I noticed something sitting on our fence. Now, we had a post fence, like very common in New England, just kind of post and rail fence. And there was something on one of the posts. And, um, you know, this is my fence, right? It's in my yard, and it's unusual that there's something there. It, it lined the sidewalk, and apparently someone had placed a key in a leather holder on top of one of the posts. And it's very odd. The fence had no gates. There was no reason for there to be a key there. So I took the key and looked at it, and it was just a normal key. It looked like a house key. It looked actually a lot like the house key that I had for my house. And so, you know, what do you do with this random key? Well, I just carried it around for a bit. There was no name on it. There was no way I could, like, put it anywhere. It was way before the internet, so I couldn't say, hey, did someone lose a key on my street? So I carried it around, and then one day I just decided to see what would happen if I put it into the door of my house. And so I put it in the front door and turned and expected nothing to happen, and uh, no, the door opened. The door opened right up, and I was like, this is a key to my house. How did a key to my house that I've never seen before and that I showed my parents and they had never seen before and I'm an only child, where did this key come from? I mean, how did it end up on the post? Nobody recognized the key holder. We had no idea. And so I told my friends about this key I found and I was at one of their homes and I recreated what I did at my house. I took the key and I said, Look, and I was just playing with it and I stuck it in the door and turned it. And I, you know, I'm at my friend's house now. It's not their key. And I turned the key and expect it not to turn. And oh no, it opened their door too. And then I went to the neighbor down the street and tried it there. Yep. It opened their door too. I had some weird master key that opened all the doors on my street where did it come from? I have no idea. So I borrowed a key from my neighbor and I took my key that I knew was for my house and I compared them to this mystery key 
and I noticed that they were very similar. The teeth were all exactly the same, but the mystery key had a bar that was much shorter than the others. And it's hard to describe, but right where the teeth of the key attached to the part that you turn, there was this like solid bar of uncut material. And on this master mystery key, that bar was missing. And that meant that you could adjust how far the key went in yourself and then just turn it wherever you wanted. And the upshot of this is I never found out where this key came from. The best I can come up with is that this key belonged to somebody else on the street who somehow ended up with a master key for all these locks, for these homes that were built at the same time by the same contractor. And they'd lost their key and someone else found it in the vicinity of my house and thought, oh, it's a key, I don't know, I'll just put it on this post and maybe someone will find it. <laughs> but I never found out whose key it was. None of the neighbors recognized it. Sadly, Shortly after this, um, it did stop working in the neighbors' houses uh, because they all changed their locks. <laughs> but we didn't. I was able to use that key as my own house key for years afterwards. Product review. So my scamp is currently parked down on the river property, and I have been down there a few times. I noticed that when I turn on the heat in the scamp, and I have it hooked up to electric heat right now, it gets very moist in there very quickly. There's there's a lot of condensation, and I don't know if I have a leak or if there's just a lot of moisture in there. And there might be, because I've done a lot of cleaning and stuff. But whatever. There's too much moisture in it. It's too cold out to ventilate it properly, and I'm not down there that much. So I need to get that moisture out. And I thought, well, I saw a video where somebody had a 12-volt dehumidifier. And while on the face of it, that doesn't sound like something that would work, I thought I'd give it a try. Now, dehumidifiers are basically just air conditioners. There's really no difference in how they're constructed. It's just what they do with the air. So a dehumidifier will focus on making coils cold. That will force water to condense out of the air and go into some kind of a container. Whereas an air conditioner will focus on blowing cold air over those coils. And all the condensation that drips off is just kind of a byproduct. And it usually goes out of hose or whatever. They're really not that different, and air conditioners will dehumidify. But to run that on 12 volts, you're basically using a 12-volt air conditioner, which is something we know only kind of sort of exists and really doesn't exist for most people in practical terms. So how does this little $35 device possibly work? And so I found out that they work with Peltier devices. Now, a Peltier device is a solid-state electronic device that when you pass current over it, one side of a plate gets cold and the other side gets hot. And, well, that's how condensation works. If you can make one side colder than the dew point, it will collect moisture. And if you blow a little air over that, that moisture will drop down into a container and boom, you've got a dehumidifier. And that's exactly how this thing works. It's the same principle as those really cheap 12 volt coolers that I do not recommend. But this thing is smaller and it doesn't seem to use that much energy. But the question is, does it work? Now, I bought this in the winter, and I haven't had a really great chance to test it out, but I have noticed some very interesting things as I've been testing it. First off, it only plugs into 110 volts. It does not have a 12-volt connector. But if you look on the adapter, it actually says it's a 12-volt adapter. So the unit itself runs on 12 volts. If you wanted to install this in your van, you might have to cut the cord. But if you did that, that would be fine. You could just attach the wires to your electrical system, and it should work fine. But it's little. And so I had it on for a few days. Now it's winter in Chicago. I had it on in my bathroom where I knew there would be humidity from time to time. And sure enough, it did start to collect little bits of water. But we're not talking about gallons here. We're talking about ounces or maybe even half an ounce, just a little bit of water. And I was thinking, ah, oh, this, you know, this thing really doesn't probably work enough to be worth it. But I did some more testing and I took a hygrometer, a device that measures humidity, and kept it in the room, and then turned this thing on to see if it would lower it. What I found was that, unfortunately, because it's winter, and I have forced air heat, and I'm running the shower, the humidity in the bathroom was all over the place, and I could not tell how much of that was impacted by this device. But what I could do was measure the humidity coming out of the airport on the top of this thing. So if I had the hygrometer, say, 10 feet away from the humidifier, it would read like 40, 50 percent, which is fairly low. But when I put it right on top where the air was blowing out of the thing, it went instantly down to 10 percent, which tells me this thing is working. It does remove moisture from the air. Now, is it practical? Is it good enough to actually dehumidify my scamp? 
I don't know, and I haven't had a chance to get down there and test it properly. So when I do, I will report back. But I thought, well, it's winter. People are having problems with humidity. I will make you aware of this thing and explain how it works, and then you can make your own decisions. Again, it's like 35 bucks. It drips water into a container that needs to be emptied. And for some reason, almost all of them have LED lights that glow and stuff. I, I don't know why. It's because I want my humidifier to attract attention to itself. I don't know. It's not all that small. It's about the size of a half-gallon milk carton, which is kind of big, and not everyone might have space for that, and it does make some noise because there's a fan blowing. And one really negative thing, in the instructions it says you're supposed to turn it off every 24 hours and let it rest for 10 minutes, which for my application of just leaving it in the scamp running all the time isn't terribly great. Anyway, I'll have a link in the show notes. There's dozens and dozens of these things. The one that I ended up with... It's called the Nine Sky Dehumidifier. It holds 40 ounces of liquid, although I've never come anywhere near to that in my circumstances. And uh, yeah, it has a seven colors LED light and has two different speeds, although I really think you're probably going to want it on high all the time. Take a look. It's something that might actually be a good thing, especially if you have a small van. But then again, you might not want to invest the space and heck, just letting some wind blow through all the open doors for five minutes might even do more. A place to visit. So I got a lovely note from Cheryl, who used to work in Antarctica. She worked at McMurdo, which is, you know, one of these dream jobs that I've always had. And uh, she confirmed for me that, you know, the dream is kind of a dream you wake up from pretty quick. She said after about two weeks there, she was ready to come home and she was just doing it for the money, like with most jobs. But still, I, I would have loved to have been able to do that. I, I think I'm kind of too old now to even think about it. But if you want to go to Antarctica and you don't want to spend thousands of dollars, you can go work there. And Cheryl sent me a couple of links on how you can go work there. Now, to be clear, this is a very unusual place to work. You, you're there in a contract. You're going to be there for a long time and you're not going to get to go home. And you're going to have limited access to the outside and very limited internet. Uh, you know, it, it's a very insular environment and it's a bit like summer camp, but a lot more restrictive if you ever worked at a summer camp. The thing is, you can go down there and you don't have to be a scientist. There are lots of jobs for people who do things like cook or clean or maintenance. And some of these jobs, they'll train you on the spot because there's nobody in regular life that knows how to do them. Or you just don't need any training. And if you really want to do that, well, heck, do it. And you're going to meet really interesting people because only interesting people work down there. Sometimes that's a bad thing. So she gave me two good links for finding jobs down there. And uh, one of them is usap.gov. That's the United States Arctic Program. Slash jobs and opportunities. I'll have a link in the show note. And the other one's even longer. It is The other one is amentumcareers.com. And they have a special section for Antarctica. And, you know, they've got... A, According to Cheryl, they've got everything from firefighters to plumbers. And heck, if you're a young person looking for adventure, but you don't have a lot of money and you want to go to Antarctica, which I loved Antarctica. I know some people don't think it's worth the effort and money to go down there. I am not one of those. It is right now. It's probably my favorite place I've ever been. And I hope that changes because that means I've been to even more exciting places. This might be a way to do it. So a place to visit Antarctica for pay. Maybe you should check it out. Resource recommendation. Now, Cheryl didn't just write me about that. She also gave me a twofer. The other thing she wrote about is a great website that's going to be useful for those of you who travel with dogs, and it's called bringfido.com. And I took a look at it, and it's, it's very simple. It, you basically go to this website and you type in where you're going. So if you go to the website and type in Chicago... It'll bring up a list of all the dog-friendly restaurants and hikes and stores there are in Chicago. And you know that you can go there with your dog. And there's some interesting things there. For example, Midwest Magic, which is an old-time magic shop in Chicago, they're totally fine if you want to bring your dog in. So if you were looking for a magic shop that accepted dogs, <laughs> Bring Fido might be the place to find one. It also mentions a lot of high-end shops on the Magnificent Mile, which is our fancy shopping district downtown. They're fine with dogs and pets. Nordstrom's? Fine. You can bring your dog in all you'd like. So this could be a really useful tool 
for people who are traveling with their dogs, but, you know, want to actually be able to do stuff too. So it's bringfido.com, just like it sounds. Yeah, I'll have a link in the show notes, but this one you don't really need the link for. Well, that wraps up episode 154. Thank you for listening, and thank you for sticking with me here. Music, as always, is by Simon Wegg. And thanks also to those of you who've gotten in touch with me lately. I've gotten lots of correspondence lately, probably because I was giving out stickers. But it doesn't matter. I really appreciate it, and it definitely helps shape the show. Until next time, remember the words of Albert Hubbard. The greatest mistake you can make in life is to be continually fearing that you will make one.